Welcome to Worship United Parish. We are all equals here, looking up to Christ our head. And anyone who shares in this confession with us is like a child of the same parent with us. So together, let's pray. Come creator into our lives. In you we live and move and have our very being. Open now the windows of our souls. Amen. I have some updates for you. Next week, you will be able to see on our YouTube channel a worship service that represents the gifts and abilities of ministers connected to us through our United Church of Christ denominational affiliation. This is a reminder to us that the ministry we do is not limited to our local geographical community, but that we are connected by region, by nation, in ministry that is going out around the world. This is one way that technology has allowed us to become more connected with each other. And another way is Mentimeter. Hopefully you saw the slide earlier. Um, this is our portal through which we can pray simultaneously, whether we are in the same room or separated by half a planet's worth of distance. We've been practicing using this resource now because throughout our transition into hybrid worship and in whatever worship God has planned for us in the future, Mentimeter is something that we can do, those of us who are in the room and those of us who are beyond this room to pray simultaneously together. That's right, the prayers you'll see later in the service are an update, uh, constantly updating, to reflect the prayers that have been added up to this very moment and later in the service. So please share your prayers with us as one body. This summer, we will be worshiping hybrid, which means that uh, you'll be invited to attend here in this building or to continue to connect with us online as you're doing today. There will be two in-person worship opportunities. One of them will be on Saturday evening at 5 p.m. One of them on Sunday morning at 9.30 a.m. And you'll still be able to get the link to our streaming worship through our streaming worship email. Now, what's happening in between next week and the beginning of our summer worship series? Our co-moderator, Brian Lasseur has prepared an invitation for you. Good morning. The 287th annual meeting of the First Congregational Church of Upton, the 147th Charge Conference of the Upton Methodist Church, and the 52nd annual meeting of the United Parish Church of Upton will be held simultaneously and virtually on Sunday, June 6, 2021. The meeting will blend business and celebration as we thank God for the year that was and look forward to the year that is and will become. Our celebration will be an opportunity to express thanks for the blessings we've shared. The business of the meeting includes to hear from the committees, officers and councils of the church, to vote on the pastor's compensation, to hear and act upon the proposed budget 
for the 12 months ending June 30th, 2022. To elect officers for the year ending June 30th, 2022. And finally, to hear and act upon any other business that may legally come before the meeting. We'll surround our work with prayer and praise to God who makes us one. Thirty voting members shall constitute a quorum. Members of the First Congregational Church of Upton and the Upton Methodist Church are entitled to vote in the United Parish of Upton Affairs. Let's continue to work to be open to change, to dream bigger, to take risks, so that we may serve God fully and faithfully. We look forward to seeing you there. Thanks. There's just one note I would like to add to Brian's meeting. You heard him say that 30 members constitute a quorum and members of uh, our church, whether they are affiliated with the United Church of Christ or the United Methodist Church, are members of this church and are eligible to vote at the meeting. I want to remind you, in case you've never thought about it, that if you have a member of your family who has been confirmed in this church, they are a voting member of our congregation. Confirmation is the welcoming into full participation in our ministry. We've all been through all of these things together. And this is not the first time that we people have undergone a shared prolonged trauma that cannot help but change who we think we are and how we choose to live. Our most recent edition of the Town Crier highlighted the legacy of this congregation in connection with the Civil War. Also, while the United States was recovering from the economic trauma of the Depression and experiencing the cultural and political trauma of the Second World War, choreographer Martha Graham envisioned a work of art, a pioneering, a ballet about a new home, a new family, a new life, a dance about America. In her ballet, she cast Asian Americans and black Americans, young and old. Her ballet was called a love letter, a valentine, her dance of hope. And about her steps, she wrote, my dancers never fall to simply fall. They fall to rise. Elaine Heath writes, institutions are necessary because they form to promote and protect the core values and purpose of the people, the movement that gives birth to the institution. But over time, institutions inevitably become rigid and inwardly focused, entombing the life they are meant to protect. When that happens, innovators within the institutions begin to appear these pioneers create new expressions of the life that formerly gave birth to the institution. We have seen this happen before many times. So much of what makes our common life, our country, and our faith has depended on a cycle of pioneering and organizing, pioneering and organizing. Some have described the feeling of realizing that they are pioneers as their hearts burning within them, or feeling their hearts strangely warmed. Our hearts are not frozen, but ready for spring thaw. We can see it in our growing ability to notice where we have been feeling numb or dull. And we can see it in our outbursts of frustration or anger or tears. These are a sign that we are increasingly ready to break out of the tomb with Christ the Lord of the dance, to pioneer new expressions of life. In resurrection season, those who have had a mystical encounter share the story to discern its meaning with others. In resurrection season, Jesus reveals the tradition behind the tradition. What they have believed all along is not untrue, but more true, more simply true than they imagined. In resurrection season, this greater understanding doesn't require them to abandon the heart of their ministry, but cleaving more closely to the heart will change their hearts and lives. So let's see how we are not alone. 
Let's remember the pioneers in the cycles before ours. Let's claim the power God gives us even now as the pioneer of resurrection taught us. Dance then wherever you may be. I am the Lord of the dance, said he, and I'll lead you all wherever you may be, and I'll lead you As Jan Greenberg and Sandra Jordan wrote in A Dance for Martha, sometimes art is made by one artist working alone, but sometimes it is the result of artists working together, collaborating to forge something new. We are not all pioneering people as individuals, but in our worship and service, we never work alone. We are always joined in the dance by the one who made our bodies and filled them with the breath of life the one who dances among us and throughout this world, and the one who had a body like ours and conquered death to become the Lord of the dance, collaborating with Creator, Spirit, and Christ. Let us join the dance and pray with our whole bodies. This body prayer has been a legacy of our spiritual ancestor, Daniel that has guided us through these seasons of separation and will become part of the celebration we do when we are worshiping in place together and connected to you. So there will be something familiar for all of us. So let us pray as one body. We begin by finding our balance, remembering that God is our rock. We focus on our breath. God has given us the breath of life then we extend our palms outward and make our bodies into a bridge of energy, remembering that Jesus taught us to pray on earth as it is in heaven. And we'll bring our hands to our heads, remembering Christ is my head. Our hands to our hearts, Christ is my heart. Our hands to our bellies, Christ is my nourishment. And we'll extend our hands outward in a gesture of abundance and blessing into an embrace that is big enough for the whole world. Now we may bow low, or as I'll do, kneel. And as we do that, we bow first to say, wow, for all that God has done throughout history. Second time to say, thanks for all that God has done for us. And the third time to say, wow, <laughs> help. To ask God to be present and felt by us in this moment for these challenges today. Then we straighten up and find our balance again and focus once more on our breath. In God, we live and move and have our very being. We finish our prayer by connecting both sides of ourselves and bowing forward at the neck, remembering that Jesus said, into your hands, I commend my spirit. Let us pray together.
Amen. I'm delighted to share with you that last Saturday, representatives of our congregation, of family, and of friends gathered together for the baptism of Jackson Mars. We recognize baptism in our tradition as the recognition of God's claim already made on God's own children and the offering of blessing and covenant to be equals with them, collaborators with them in the way of Jesus Christ. Soon we will be able to celebrate baptisms in our hybrid worship services, but until then, we are tying these moments together with prayer and faith in God who was and is and ever shall be. So let us all extend the strength, compassion, and courage of our hearts toward parents Rebecca and Andrew as we pray for them for their son, Jackson. Of Jackson Mars, and for the presence today of his sponsors, Melissa Gruber and Jeff Gruber. Beloved in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water and the Spirit. All of this is God's gift, offered to us without price. Through the reaffirmation of our faith, we renew the covenant declared at our baptism. 
acknowledge what God is doing for us, and a firmer commitment to Christ's holy church.
Jackson, child of God, you are sealed by the Holy Spirit in baptism and claimed as Christ's beloved forever. Rebecca, Andy, Linda, Melissa, and Jeff, you may remember your baptism. that you too are a child proudly claimed and deeply loved by God. Our readings today come from Acts and Paul's letter to the Galatians. Galatians 5, 16 through 26, taken from the Common English Bible. I say, be guided by the Spirit, and you won't carry out your selfish desires. A person's selfish desires are set against the Spirit, and the Spirit is set against one's selfish desires. They are opposed to each other, so you shouldn't do whatever you want to do. But if you are being led by the Spirit, you aren't under the law. The actions that are produced by selfish motives are obvious, since they include immorality, moral corruption, doing whatever feels good, idolatry, drug use and casting spells, hate, fighting, obsession, losing your temper, competitive opposition, conflict, selfishness, group rivalry, jealousy, drunkenness, partying, and other things like that. I warn you, as, have I, already, as I have already warned you, that those who do these kind of things won't inherit God's kingdom. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against things like this. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the self with its passions and its desires. If we live by the Spirit, let's follow the Spirit. Let's not become arrogant, make each other angry, or be jealous of each other. Acts 2, verses 1 through 4. When Pentecost Day arrived, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound from heaven, like the howling of a fierce wind, filled the entire house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be individual flames of fire alighting on each one of them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit enabled them to speak. This ends our readings for today. Thank you, Kathy, for those readings. I'd like to start today by sharing a book with you that I have loved for a long time and has been one of the inspirations of this series. It's called The Keeping Quilt by Patricia Polacco. When my great-grandma Anna came to America, she wore the same thick overcoat and big boots she had worn for farm work. But her family weren't dirt farmers anymore. In New York City, her father's work was hauling things on a wagon, and the rest of the family made artificial flowers all day. Everyone was in a hurry. And it was so crowded, not like in back home Russia. But all the same, it was their home. And most of their neighbors were just like them. When Anna went to school, English sounded to her like pebbles dropping into shallow water. In six months, she was speaking English. Her parents almost never learned, so she spoke English for them, too. The only thing she had left of back home Russia were her dress and the babushka she liked to throw up into the air when she was dancing. and her dress was getting too small. After her mother had sewn her a new one, she took her old dress and babushka. Then from a basket of old clothes, she took Uncle Vladimir's shirt 
on Havala's nightdress and an apron of Aunt Natasha's. We will make a quilt to help us always remember home, Anna's mother said. It will be like having the family in back home Russia dance around us at night. And so it was. Anna's mother invited all the neighborhood ladies. They cut out animals and flowers from the scraps of clothing Anna kept the needles threaded and handed them to the ladies as they needed them. The border of the quilt was made from Anna's babushka. On Friday nights, Anna's mother would say the prayers that started the Sabbath. The family ate challah and chicken soup. The quilt was the tablecloth. Anna grew up and fell in love with great-grandpa Sasha. To show he wanted to be her husband, he gave Anna a gold coin, a dried flower, and a piece of rock salt, all tied into a linen handkerchief. The gold was for wealth, the flower for love, and the salt so that their lives would have flavor. She accepted the hanky, and they were engaged. Under the wedding chuppah, Anna and Sasha promised each other love and understanding. After the wedding, the men and women celebrated separately. When my grandma Carla was born, Anna wrapped her daughter in the quilt to welcome her warmly into the world. Carla was given a gift of gold, flour, salt, and bread. Gold so she would never know poverty, a flower so she would always know love, salt so her life would always have flavor, and bread so that she would never know hunger. Carla learned to keep the Sabbath and to cook and clean and do washing. Married you'll be someday, Anna told Carla, and... Again, the quilt became a wedding chuppah. This time for Carla's wedding to Grandpa George. Men and women celebrated together, but they still did not dance together. In Carla's wedding bouquet was a gold coin, bread, and salt. Carla and George moved to a farm in Michigan, and Great Grandma Anna came to live with them. The quilt once again wrapped a new little girl, Mary Ellen. Mary Ellen called Anna Lady Grandma. She had grown very old and was sick a lot of the time, and the quilt kept her legs warm. On Anna's 98th birthday, the cake was a kulik, a rich cake with raisins and candied fruit in it. When Great Grandma Anna died, prayers were said to lift her soul to heaven my mother, Mary Ellen, was now grown up. When Mary Ellen left home, she took the quilt with her. When she became a bride, the quilt became her chuppah. For the first time, friends who were not Jews came to the wedding. My mother wore a suit, but in her bouquet were gold, bread, and salt. The quilt welcomed me, Patricia, into the world. And it was the tablecloth for my first birthday party. At night, I would trace my fingers around the edges of each animal on the quilt before I went to sleep. I told my mother stories about the animals on the quilt. She told me whose sleeve had made the horse, whose apron had made the chicken, whose dress had made the flowers, and whose babushka went around the edge of the quilt. The quilt was a pretend cape when I was in the bullring, or sometimes a tent in the streaming Amazon jungle. At my wedding to Enzo Mario, men and women danced together. In my bouquet were gold, bread, and salt, and a sprinkle of wine, so I would always know laughter.
20 years ago, I held Tracy Denise in the quilt for the first time. Someday she too will leave home and she will take the quilt with her. Please pray with me. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For you are our rock, our strength, and our redeemer. Amen. Our lives are made of these moments, aren't they? Graduation from one institution to the next, the commencement of new journeys. I've always loved how each generation's practice has honored the traditions of the past, but also become specific in important ways to the individual lives they embrace. We are not all the same. What brings us together also reveals what makes each of us special. In this family story, the quilt becomes an institution that is not rigid, but flexible, and which allows a family to find their place of sanctuary amid great changes and transformations. The creation of this flexible institution is only possible because the family collaborated, each sacrificing a little toward a vision of something beautiful and lasting, a gift of hope. Critics call Appalachian Spring a dance of hope. To create it, authors Jordan and Greenberg imagine, quote, Martha listens to Aaron's music. In it, she hears the rollicking echo of a Virginia reel, the galloping energy of a rodeo, the lilting melody of a shaker hymn. She begins work turning steps into patterns that will bring the dance to life. She bases the pioneer woman on her great-grandmother. She went from Virginia to Pennsylvania, her family in search of good soil to till. She was very beautiful and always very still. In the ballet, the pioneer woman turns and sways in and out and around the lively and playful dancers, her steps light and graceful, a quiet force of nature. Amid all the struggle and the seeking of her ancestors, Martha's great-grandmother carries stillness and grace within and becomes a symbol of faith in the longer story, a story of collaboration, a symbol of promises kept, a symbol of hope. And Elaine Heath, another source of inspiration, as she writes about faith and early Christianity and pioneers, she writes, quote, I am increasingly coming to understand God's personality and method as less like Zeus smiting people who don't comply or being two men and a bird orchestrating events to go in their direction. God, the Trinity is more like three spry, tireless, fearless, and relentless grandmothers plotting the salvation of the world. What an image. Quilting grandmothers, pioneer women, plotting the salvation of the world. An old-fashioned quilting circle as an image of God. If that were so, then this day, this Pentecost day, would be the day that we take to remember that these spry grandmothers decided not to assign us blessings in a will to be parceled out after their death, that we humans might come into our own only after God's work is done. No. These fearless grandmothers have handed them out to us now to enjoy along with us our full inheritance. Pentecost is a theological scandal. God has taken God's assets, God's qualities, and distributed them among God's children. None has the full set, but together we are the full set. Why would God give away God's advantage like this? 
It's not the way that a conquering hero runs the world, right? It doesn't even seem like the way a competent manager would run the world. Wouldn't God be afraid that like the prodigal son, we're just going to waste our portion of the inheritance and nearly destroy ourselves in the process? How could great-grandmother -grand Anna bear to part with the quilt her mother had made for her in her lifetime? How could she give it away to be used by children and young couples? Wasn't she afraid someone would tear it or spill it or lose it? Martha Graham, Aaron Copeland, and Isamu Noguchi, each of whose art had been criticized by powerful people and each of whom had seen the destructive power of bigotry and nationalism in this country, performed their work of hope live before the American people. How could they? Weren't they afraid they'd be misunderstood, abused? The letter of Paul's to, to the Galatians explains why. By explaining that the Spirit of God is incompatible with selfishness. Selfishness and the Spirit repel each other. God cannot keep God's gifts to God's self, regardless of the consequences, because God cannot be selfish like that. And a gift given only continues to be a gift if it is shared, if it is allowed to be a gift for others again and again. When we collaborate together to give something away while it still holds value for us, we're like God. In our morning prayer services, we have concluded by saying, we will not offer to God offerings that cost us nothing. And in saying that, we are praying to become more like God. And it is scandalous. It is scandalous. Because when something becomes normal and acceptable, then it costs us less. So when we want to live as Christians in the legacy of the scandalous gift-giving of Pentecost, we will be weird. We will not be normal. We will not do what everyone else is already doing. People may even look at us and say that we are drunk, which is what happened to that community at Pentecost in the verses following the reading this morning. If God is plotting the salvation of the world and we are God's collaborators, then not only must we not be selfish, we also must not be content with simply following the rules. As in the Keeping Quilt, we can only participate in the Christian traditions if we continue to customize them to the specific lives they embrace. The rules about managing and describing what has been, about trying to orchestrate and organize what is, not about pioneering what will be. Paul tells the Galatians that they are free because they have their inheritance already. And with Christ's help, they have conquered both selfishness and the tomb of rigid institutions. God has made them pioneers with the authority to determine what is right, not on the basis of what is popular, not on the basis of what has worked in the past, but because they are connected to God's spirit through their gifts. Paul isn't the only one who makes this argument. Jesus said to his followers, I assure you that whatever you fasten on earth will be fastened in heaven. And whatever you loosen on earth will be loosened in heaven. Again, I assure you that if two of you on earth agree about anything you ask, then my Father who is in heaven will do it for you. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I'm there with them. Elaine Heath writes, as was the case with the gospel movement launched by Jesus and with Paul's major shift to welcome Gentiles as members of God's household, our challenge is both theological and practical. What do our spry, relentless, divine grandmothers make of us? What do they make of us? 
What do they think of how we're using our inheritance? What do they want to see? I believe that like all grandparents, for their beloved grandchildren, they want love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Don't get discouraged. Yes, we have all failed to bear these fruits of the Spirit in our actions at times. Yes, each of us has experienced some obsession, losing our temper, competitive opposition, conflict, group rivalry, jealousy, etc. in recent months. So, let's take this invitation of Pentecost and the new things which are coming as an opportunity to reset. Let's shake off our guilt and focus on shaping our beliefs and our behavior in collaboration with the relentless grandmothers who are saving the world. Just like baby Jackson. Just like all of our college graduates. Let this be a festival of commencement. I'd like to invite you to join me in this ritual adapted from the work of writer Marianne Williamson. As you listen and respond, I encourage you to remember that you and I are not alone. That there are many who have and are and will be part of this ritual with us. Picture them around you. Hear their voices as we pray. Beloved, on this day, you are charged by God to enter formally with us, the worldwide people of God, into the actions of the Spirit. You have lived these years of your life. Now you are pioneering a new one. Although we do not offer you a perfect world, we invite you now to collaborate with us fully in the sacred task of healing it and making it whole. From this day forward, with our blessing and support, you shall receive the gifts of your full inheritance. You shall be full director with God of their movement through your life. Now repeat after me, beginning with your own name. I, Lori, am a part of this community. I have lived these years of my life. Now I dedicate the rest of my life to God. and God's purposes on earth. I am who I am. And I draw strength from those who came before me. I honor you, the community of my neighbors, for what you have done and have not done. To make the world I inherit a place of peace and love. I forgive you, the community of my neighbors, for what you have done and have not done. To make the world I inherit a place of broken dreams. 
I apologize to you for what I have done and for what I have not done. with what I have been given. Beloved, with this ceremony, you take on the yoke of citizenship, full and complete in spiritual community. May you know in your life the joy of the abundant actions of the Spirit. May the world honor you for who you are Wherever you go, our blessings go with you. Whatever you do, may you find guidance and support. May you always consider us your loving friends and so doing be a pioneer without fear, creating gifts of hope. May you realize that the one embracing you, accepting you, Connecting with you is God. Let the tension in your body release as you feel God's support and love. We bring prayers to God to collaborate with God, trusting that God is faithful to us in our distress, is still creating the possible with us, and is present at all our celebrations, our partner in the dance. Let us pray. Beloved, there are many ways to pray with the community of United Parish, and we've been taught to pray without ceasing anytime, anywhere, so let us pray. Powerful God, on this Pentecost day, we remember that all that we have trusted in you, all that we have depended upon in you, all that we have needed from you and admired in you and found beautiful in you, you have shared with all of us and we can find in one another. 
You have woven us together. You have stitched us to each other to make us a part of a project that is portable, that is usable, that is durable, that is beautiful. Help us to see these qualities in ourselves as we commence with you a new journey. We know that we are not perfect, but we trust you in all our ways. And so today we pray especially for new life in faith within our congregation and around the world. We pray for this new journey and for all of those who are commencing a new chapter of their lives. We also pray for those whose life on this earth is drawing to a close and for the eternal life that continues for them in you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We remember our siblings around the world, children of the same parent with us, all beloved by God, not only in India, but also in Taiwan and in many places. We are all part of this together, but we are all special and necessary. You know, for pioneers, a quilt means survival. Besides its beauty, a quilt can use scraps unfit for any other purpose to create something durable, protective, portable, and warm. The quilting, the rows of stitching that bind three or more layers of fabric together, creates pockets of air that trap body heat and hold together over generations of hard use. Those stitches are what make, what take the most time, whether the quilt is simple or elaborate, and they are most important to its usefulness. Now, most quilting is done by machine. But for most pioneers, their quilting was done by hand. Just like raising a barn, hand quilting on a bed-sized quilt has always been made possible by bringing together the whole neighborhood to labor together, each with stitches as personal as a signature. Our community here at United Parish is doing joyful labor together. And in this work, we cherish your hands. We have just completed this weekend another annual seedling sale, which over the past couple of years has become a tradition that is beloved by our membership. It speaks to us of our delight in God's creation, of the powerful love that we experience and share with God as we tend to the earth. It has taught us something new about how to grow things. Some of the people who have contributed seedlings to our sale are people who have never tried to grow from seed before. And the blessings that come forth from these plants, the fruit that they bear throughout the whole length of the season and into September will be a reminder that we are doing something together. We are experiencing redemption. The proceeds from the seedling sale are a fundraiser for the Building and Grounds Committee. These are those members of this community who have been making sure that our physical space, our geographical space is carefully tended and maintained and kept beautiful so that when you are able to visit us here, 
you will find it just as strong as we are in heart. There is another project which is commencing with us. We have been talking so much about quilting that we've been inspired to create quilted paraments for the sanctuary. Now, paraments refer to sometimes the cloths that you might see draped over the pulpit or over where the reader reads and on the communion table around which we gather. These are symbols of celebration, of labor, of connectedness, of joy, and they often in their colors and shapes remind us of a deeper truth about God that we experience not with our ears but with our eyes. This is going to be a work-intensive project, and what's beautiful about that is that it means that every time we look at it, we will remember how it felt to make this happen with our hands. A group of us who have started to dream up this project are aiming for a way of doing this together that can be done by children at home, that can be done by advanced sewers with sewing machines, that can be done by cross-stitchers with a hoop. So I hope that you will keep your eyes and ears open for opportunities to participate in that. And if you love this kind of creativity, we'd love to include you in this process at the start. I would praise God if this is a project that is ready to, display, to be displayed when we have our homecoming worship in the fall. I want to remind you again that summer worship is commencing soon at 5 o'clock on Saturday evenings and at 9.30 on Sundays. These worship services are going to be completely led by this community. I'm going to be taking some time away this summer to rest and renew myself and uh, also to offer to this community the chance to come together around the quilting circle and make this new thing together. I hope that you will come out um, if you feel comfortable doing so and we'll think about which service um, is more practical, not just for you, but also lends support to those who are learning to lead in this capacity. If you want to learn more or would like to get involved in more ways to help, Email unitedparishoffice at yahoo.com or comment in our website or send a personal message to one of our ministers whom you have come to know. Community is a powerful thing. Collaboration is a powerful thing. Just as Aaron Copeland was inspired by their pioneering egalitarian, nonviolent ways, the Shakers have, through, through their witness, changed what we all believe to be possible for people in this country. In this worship series, we honor their courageous influence in our interpretation of some of their gift songs. The kingdom of God is not a dream. It is a promise God is keeping.
Martha's ballet ends as the husbandmen and the bride enter their new house alone. The final lingering notes seem to ask, what will happen tomorrow? This is our commencement. We are dancers in a ballet of hope. We are quilters making something beautiful and strong from the best of what has been. We do not fall to simply fall, we fall to rise. This week, in collaboration with the God who makes all things new, with the conviction through Christ that you are beloved, and with a pioneering Holy Spirit, may you begin to work, turning steps into patterns that will bring the dance to life. May you go in peace to love and serve both God and neighbor. Amen. <laughs>